and welcome. Thank you all for joining our third Vital Voices session of the 2024-2025 academic year. Um, we are wanting to welcome all of you here in person. Y'all get the pizza. That's good. But we also want to welcome all of you on Zoom. Um, sorry, we can't send pizza to you. So next time, come in person. Um, my name is Dr. Diane Miller, and I'm the Interim Associate Dean of the College of Public Service for this year, and we're just super excited to be hosting this session. From the Schoolhouse to the Courthouse, the History of Policing Mexican-American Students in Houston Schools. So before we get to the main event, I have to brag for a little bit, and I'm going to have to read because I'm going to make sure I get all of our lovely statistics correct about the College of Public Service. The Wall Street Journal recently ranked UHD among the 400 best colleges in the U.S. Best. Specifically, we were recognized as being number one for diversity and number three for student experience. And there are a lot of wonderful things happening at UHD, but specifically here at the College of Public Service, we've got our Masters of Science in Criminal Justice. Who else a criminal justice major in here? Are you undergrad or graduate? Graduate. So you're already with us with our MSCJ, so you know it's an award-winning program. And those of you who are doing your undergrads, you know where you're coming next for your next degree, right? Um, and it's this program has been recognized as one of the best online programs in the country by U.S. News and World Report for the sixth year in a row. And is anybody in here an urban ed major? No? Well, I'm going to brag on it anyway. Oh, wait, wait. Yes! Juan's over there. All right, great. So um, in the urban education program, TEA has taken notice of our program. Uh, we got a commendation for preparing the educators that Texas needs for our bilingual and ESL program because it's a shortage area in the state. And moreover, the program was one of only three to receive a commendation for preparing educators for long-term success because our five-year retention rate is super duper high. So we're very proud of that as well. But here in the public College of Public Service, we believe that any public service career, whether in urban education, social work, or criminal justice, which is kind of the focus for today's session, right, isn't just a job. Rather, it's a calling pursued by individuals who are passionate about contributing to the well-being of our community. It's good stuff, right? Our faculty, staff, and students make the College of Public Service a special place in which to work and learn, and we're grateful that you've chosen to spend some time with us here this evening. So with that, I want to welcome Mr. Stephen Villano. He's the director of the Center for Public Service and Community Research, Research and he's going to introduce our speakers. He's the mastermind behind these events. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And I, I want to give a... Um, a little shout out to Dr. Miller. Is this on? Oh, here it is. Um, I have never seen anyone work. She is like the Energizer Bunny, if you've seen those commercials. I mean, this woman is just, she does everything, and she does everything well, and she does everything quick, and she does everything fast. You really have to keep on your toes. Yes, I, yeah, I know, that's a good idea. So welcome everybody here, and welcome everybody online. Um, I am going to tell you a little bit about Vital Voices. We like to bring in speakers who speak not only to the subjects, whether it's criminal justice, social work, or urban ed, but we like to speak about, we like to have them speak about interdisciplinary issues, such as going to be the case tonight, um, where it's involving all three of those disciplines. And not only are speakers uh, experts in the field, but they're also practitioners in the field. So. We, over the years, have uh, talked about homelessness, and homelessness, recidivism, youth in the criminal justice system, which is part of what we'll be talking about tonight, um, the graying of America, cognitive dissonance, voting justice, modern day slavery. We just, we just had a session on emotional dysregulation. We just had the head of the FBI here in September talking about everything you would want to know about the FBI. FBI. Well, almost everything, but you know, they, they told us a lot. So we, we, and we have an upcoming session on uh, the state of education uh, in, in the state of Texas, where we're going to have a panel of educators, parents, and students talk about what's going on here in Texas. So uh, some good stuff coming up. And next Thursday, we have a session on called Shopping Under, Sus uh, Under Suspicion. Shopping Under Suspicion, and that is going to be led by Dr. Gabadon of, uh, of Penn State University. He's going to come and speak about that. So tonight, I want to introduce, I hate reading, but there was just too much stuff to memorize. So tonight, we have Dr. Carlos Cantu, 
who is an adjunct here at the University of Houston downtown, and he's also full-time at Texas Southern University. Dr. Cantu serves on the board of the Holocaust Museum's Houston Latinx Initiative, their advisory committee, and he co-founded the Collective of Progressive Educators, a Houston-based nonprofit focusing on promoting public history projects. Um, Dr. Cantu has studied and researched the history of Mexican-American students in educational activism, alternative Chicano uh, education, and Texas-based independent Chicano colleges for over 15 years. He has published uh, his work on alternative Chicago, Chicana, Chicano colleges in South Texas studies and the Journal of South Texas Studies. He's presented papers on the educational histories of Mexican Americans at annual regional and national conferences, including the Texas State Historical Association, the Western History Association, the American Historical Association, uh, the American Historical Association Pacific Coast Branch, and the Alumni of College Color Conference at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He received his BA and a master's degree in history from the University of Texas, Rio Grande and uh, Rio Grande Valley and a PhD in history in 2016 from the University of Houston. And along with him, we have Dr. Jesus Jesse Esparza is an associate professor and interim chair, ask him about that later, of the Department of History at Texas Southern University here in Houston. His area of expertise is on the history of Latinos in the United States, emphasizing civil rights activism. Dr. Esparza's manuscript, Raza Schools, The Fight for Latino Educational Autonomy in a West Texas Borderlands, Borderlands Town, was published by the University of Oklahoma Press as part of their New direction, Directions in Tejano History series. It received two book awards. The 2024 Outstanding Book Award by the Texas Association of Chicanos in Higher Education and the 2024 Tejas Foco Nonfiction Book Award by the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies. Dr. Esparza teaches Mexican American Texas and Civil Rights History. And he received his BA and master's degree from Southwest Texas State University and his PhD also from the University of Houston. Phew, a lot, of, a lot of stuff there. So, all right, so without further ado, Dr. Cantu and Dr. Esparza, welcome. Appreciate you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's my privilege, and I'll, I'll let Carlos here in a moment uh, express his sentiments, but it's certainly my privilege and my honor to, to, to be here tonight. I wanna thank uh, Stephen and all of his colleagues and certainly the departments, uh, the College for Public Service and the Center for Public Service, and certainly for putting on tonight's program, Vital Voices. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity to share this space, this intellectual space, here physically and then also virtually. So thank you all on Zoom and thank you all in the audience for coming out tonight. And I think you would have been here anyway without the pizza, so right? So, um, so I, 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 wanna, I wanna share a little bit uh, about sort of how it is that we got to this point tonight. And I wanna start with uh, an anecdote that occurred back in 1977. The 1977 wrongful beating and murder of a Vietnam uh, War veteran, Joe Campos Torres, by officers of the Houston Police Department serves as one of the most notorious examples of police misconduct in the city's history. Torres' death ignited an intense period of protest for years after that. From the investigation and the court cases that ensued, the guilty officers received a one-year prison sentence for a felony misdemeanor and 10 years for violating Torres' constitutional uh, rights uh, but then had those sentences suspended for just five years probation. This decision angered the Chicano community who mobilized to form several coalitions throughout the city. Uh, these coalitions were multiracial. These coalitions were multiracial. I think I lost my mic. They were also uh, multi-generational uh, and they had become the face of social justice in the city. Uh, and uh, the Joe Torres case is as one of the, the it, it's, this anecdote is more than an anecdote, it's also a chapter uh, in a forthcoming manuscript that myself and Carlos and several others in the room tonight are a part of. Um, the book that's, that's, that's currently being uh, reviewed is titled The Barrio and the Badge, A History of Latinos and Law Enforcement in Houston, 
Uh, and it's a book that's dedicated to uh, uncovering over a hundred year history of the relationship between Latinos and police forces, any police force in the city of Houston. There is no book that exists that does that, not in East Texas, not in the city. Uh, there are some that exist for places like Dallas and Los Angeles, certainly in Chicago, but not for Houston. Uh, the examples and the experiences of Latinos in Houston is virtually uh, invisible still. And so we aim to change that. We aim to uh, undo that. And we're doing it with this 12 edited volume. Uh, it's under advanced contract with the University of Oklahoma Press. Uh, again, as, as part of its series, The New Direction in Tejano History. Uh, and it's broken up into two parts, 12 chapters into two parts. Part one, chapters one through six, provide a chronological history of the relationship between Latinos and law enforcement. And it reveals a relationship uh, just saturated with conflict and cooperation. As one of our writer contributors mentioned, there is no singular experience when you think about the relationship between Latinos and law enforcement. There's the good, the bad, the ugly, and the beautiful. And this is what this book is attempting to capture and has captured. Uh, and so chapter one, for example, chapter one uh, uh, provides us the early policing experiences of Mexican Americans in the city of Houston. And you'll, when you get your hands on it, because I'm sure you will, you'll be learning about bootlegging women who were arrested by law enforcement because uh, they, they were these queen pins of the bootlegging industry here in Houston, Texas in the 1920s. Chapter two looks at the Latino integration of the Houston Police Department. Uh, in, throughout the 1940s and 50s, chapter three, which is my chapter, looks at ex instances and examples of police brutality during the Chicano movement. Chapter four looks at the Joe Torres case of 1977. Chapter five looks at uh, the, uh, the history of the Chicano Squad, which, just, which the documentary just was aired about two weeks ago on a and &E. uh, And so chapter five looks at the Chicano Squad. Chapter six looks at their contemporary time and explores the experiences and the roles of Chicanos within the Black Lives Matter movement. And this is what the first part of the book does. I sit in the first part of the book. Carlos kicks off second part of the book, the part two of the book, which offers a more thematic approach to telling this story. Uh, also six chapters, seven through 12. Uh, but Carlo, Dr. Cantu's chapter, chapter seven, looks at the policing of Mexican-American youth in Houston public schools. That's today's lecture that you're gonna get uh, to hear in a moment. He's gonna share a fraction of that here with you now. Chapter eight looks at um, the increased militarization and weaponization of police forces, primarily HPD, but not just HPD. Chapter nine looks at, uh, uses music and takes a cultural analysis approach uh, and looks at uh, Chicano hip hop and the critique that Chicano hip hop artists in Houston used in their lyrics to criticize police brutality. That's what chapter nine does. Chapter 10 focuses on uh, Latinos within positions of power in law enforcement. And we have those are done gleaned through oral histories, beautifully done. Chapter 11 provides a gender analysis of these experiences, it looks at the roles and the experiences of Latina officers in any police force here in the city of Houston, but mostly HPD. And then the last chapter uh, discusses the, the experiences of uh, police forces and their policing of the immigrant community here in the city. And so this is a forthcoming manuscript. Uh, and we encourage you to get your hands on it. We encourage you to ask your instructors to make it part of the reading list. We ask that you get your libraries to, to purchase, make an institutional copy. And certainly when our writers, our contributors are going around uh, marketing the book, go to their lectures and come in and, and see them speak again and ask more questions. And, and this is what we want to do. And so this is not a book that we want to keep just on the shelf. This is something that we want to continue to put out in the public and to continue to have these kinds of conversations. And so, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the end of our presentation and we'll talk about COPE. But this is the mission. The mission is to get this information out and make it a community effort and not just something that some scholars did back at the ivory tower. So without further delay, then let me shift over here to Carlos, who wants to share a few words also, and then he will jump into his lecture. Thank you. I, I got this mic. So I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm not sure if this is on or not. Can you hear me? Yes? No? Can you maybe? OK. All right, well, let me build on just a few words, a few ideas that, uh, from what Jesse's just shared with us. Um, 
you know, this project, right, starts as an academic project. We went to a presentation, or we did a presentation at a conference at Knox. Uh, uh, we were all there together. Um, and there were some uh, individuals in the audience wanting to know more. Where's, where'd you get this odd, uh, uh, information? Where can I get access to this information? And so that triggered this idea of not just having this book written for academics, but rather you know, trying to produce some sort of uh, public facing projects, public history projects. And so that is where the origins of uh, COPE started from. You know, I wanted to have some sort of vehicle for funding, right? To do our own thing, right? Uh, and so uh, it, it was inspired by these types of questions, by community members who are asking for this information. And we thought, well, you know, this research is about the community, so we should put this out into the community and, and try to do some events. Uh, I'll share with you one of the events that we did. This is History Harvest Day, policing Bio City. Uh, this is uh, in June earlier this year. There's a flyer. You can see Jesse, you know, making friends over here. Um, I will tell you this, you know, so this is a controversial topic, right? We had opened this up to the community to come out, please come and share your stories. Well, what we realized is that not a lot of people wanted to talk about their stories of being in trouble with the law. And so uh, we really did not have anybody come up, uh, come out. And, uh, uh, you know, it was unfortunate. We, 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 we were uh, well prepared. We had invited community partners to, to help out. And they stepped up. Everybody stepped up, uh, you know, to do their part. But we didn't, you know, we had visitors. We had people who, you know, loved what we were doing, enjoyed, you know, this is great. We want to, we need more of this. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't, we were not able to harvest or collect oral histories, the things that we wanted to uh, 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 collect that day, right? That's what a history harvest day is. We, we, we invite people, um, we'll set up an oral history setup, uh, we'll, we'll scan some documents if they bring them, and, um, uh, and you know, just, uh, you know, we know this is a rough history, right? It's a rough topic, and, and, but it's also a necessary one, one that we need to, you know, stay engaged with, keep the conversation going. We're not looking for for any kind of apologies from anybody, but what we are looking for is to engage in, in a civil discourse, right? So, uh, so that is what today is, is about. So we're very grateful to be here to share our, 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 our history, to share this story about uh, policing youth because uh, you know, it's, it's still something that happens, right? I, my, my goal in this paper is to historicize what is happening here, right? Uh, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I have a... I have, I have some notes. I want to make sure I don't forget anything. Uh, but when I started researching this topic, the policing of Houston uh, public school youth, Mexican American youth, um, I had resigned myself to this idea that, you know, examining this type of experience, this type of history, um, was going to focus on the plight of Mexican American kids. Um, you know, and, that, and so we're going to see victimization, or at least in my mind, I was thinking about victimized youth, um, you know, vulnerable youth. Um, uh, because, you know, to tell you the truth, I favor social history, uh, community activism, right? People who are pushing back. Um, but, you know, as I was doing this research, little by little, started getting interrupted in my research. And instead of just finding these, uh, you know, experiences of hardship, I was finding examples of community pushing back in the 1920s. LULAC pushing back as well. Mayo, right? Armas in the 1960s, student youth. Um, there's also new Spanish language newspapers also going back to the 1920s. Uh, uh, the Gaceta Mexicana, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, producing these stories about police brutality, about the hardships that Mexican Americans were having in schools. Uh, later in the 1960s, 1970s, Chicano newsletters, right, are producing, saying a lot of the same words, going through the same uh, similar uh, experiences. Uh, talking about police brutality. And so this evolved my thinking uh, on the focus of this paper, the focus of this chapter. Uh, while stories about policing youth, whether it's in the historical past or you know, in recent contemporary times, um, are, are dramatic, right? It's tra you know, and, and tragic at the same time, tragic narratives. But the response to this you know, tragedies are also quite dramatic as well. 
Um, more importantly, these actions, you know, disrupt that, this narrative that Mexican-American youth were simply policed youth, that they were victims, passive victims, and that's not accurate. It's not true. Um, so, uh, you know, the Mexican-American community were not only protectors of their youth, but even the youth, right, in the examples of the student walkouts, they too are protectors of themselves, right? The youth are, are, are pushing back for the experiences that they're facing in schools. So policing Mexican-American youth in Texas, I'm sorry, this might be a little high, so I, I apologize for not being able to, I'm a short guy, so. Uh, the policing of Mexican American youth in Texas public schools in the 20th century is rooted uh, in this long legacy of uh, exclusionary and subtractive education. So what I mean by subtractive is, you know, the removal of foreignisms in a, <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep on forgetting to speak directly into the mic. Uh, so, uh, you know, exclusionary and, and, and subtractive practices. So this is the removal of all foreignisms, right? Spanish language, even Mexican-American ethnic Mexican teachers, uh, tracing back to the Juan Crow practices of the early 20th century. When the promises and the efforts of the civil rights movement, the Chicano movement, were starting to materialize in the late 70s, early 1980s, um, the pattern of discrimination, including student tracking, uh, English-only curriculums, appeared to be ending by the late 70s, right? Early 1980s, Anglo educators, uh, leaders, law enforcement authorities then started to adopt alternative, uh, alternatives to exclude and to push out Mexican American students, undesirable students uh, from uh, Houston public schools. And so what we will see over the past 40 years is this exclusionary discipline, uh, zero uh, tolerance policies, um, permanent police presence in public schools will dramatically transform the experiences of Mexican American youth in Houston schools. So like I said, in this paper, I'm trying to historicize, right, the policing of Mexican Americans, uh, Mexican American students in Houston by examining the, the discriminatory effects of Mexican American students policing the education of Mexican Americans in Houston is yet another pattern of, uh, uh, pattern of exclusion. Here we see a list of kind of a timeline of these different patterns, right? Getting started pretty early on in the 20th century. Uh, and this is specifically focused on Texas schools, right? Uh, 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 this history, this timeline. This talk will show how the origins of the authority, uh, the, the history of the exclusionary discipline of Mexican American youth shifted, evolved, and transitioned over time. Uh, patterns that emerged and became entrenched in the early 20th century, the early decades of the 20th century, will later transition to zero tolerance policies, the growing presence of uh, police officers in schools, uh, perpetuating discriminatory patterns, uh, many of that we see here on this list, uh, resulting in increased uh, uh, school dropouts, uh, uh, less graduations, uh, decrease in, in high school grade graduation rates, college enrollments, uh, individually, you know, uh, at a local level or individual level, this means lower wages for that individual, uh, less health care coverage, limited work opportunities, and a collective level or at a collective level, community-wide, this also means less consumer spending, more need for social services, fewer skills to support the Houston growing economy. In the early 20th century, ethnic Mexican populations, uh, uh, people from rural Texas communities, immigrants from Mexico are coming into Houston, coming into the country uh, to work on the new railroad lines, right? Doing industrial work, working in factories, uh, the shipyard, uh, the ship channel, I mean, uh, and the nearby oil fields. Between 1880, 1930, we see ethnic Mexican population increase in Houston from about 75 individuals to 15,000 individuals, so a matter of 50 years. 
uh, in the first decades of the 20th century, Mexican-Americans are moving into um, different neighborhoods, rather uh, a segregated city uh, in segregated uh, neighborhoods, uh, starting to attend segregated schools. Uh, and we see the segregation because African-Americans that had lived here in this region, whether they uh, worked in the uh, cotton fields or they worked in the sugar cane plantations nearby, after the Civil War entered the city um, and you know, in their entry into Houston, started to live in, in segregated neighborhoods. So by the time Mex Mexicanos came into the area, they're moving into a segregated city. And so that's what I'm talking about. That's what I mean when I say that. Uh, and they moved into neighborhoods like uh, El Segundo Barrio in the Second Ward, El Crisol in Denver Harbor, the North Side, the Heights, Magnolia Park, uh, just to name a few. Uh, and they attended segregated schools like uh, segregated schools for Mexicans like Lubbock, Jones, Rusk, De Savala Elementaries. Uh, and a lot of these schools were uh, inadequate. They were overcrowded, uh, in need of repairs. Uh, many times, uh, you know, the teachers were inexperienced going to school there or teaching at those schools before going into more, uh, uh, you know, better schools. Uh, the, class, the, course, uh, the class materials were, were secondhand in many cases. In comparison, the earliest schools for white students had better quality education in terms of curriculum, in terms of teachers, and also had more expensive buildings, uh, teaching materials and, and school grounds, right? Playgrounds, that kind of thing. As with the schools for Mexicans in, Mex uh, in Houston, many of these communities replace, uh, replaced previously all white neighborhoods. They moved into vacant homes, uh, built their own houses, or built, uh, uh, help uh, attach more uh, bedrooms to their houses and establish boarding, uh, boarding houses, that kind of thing. Mexican Houstonians moved into neighborhoods that, had, that were displaced by Anglos that were already prepared to leave, starting to move out into uh, the surrounding suburbs. But some of these schools formerly educated white children uh, by the 1920s came to serve exclusively uh, ethnic Mexican children. The earliest, earliest of these public schools to serve ethnic children was Rusk Elementary. Uh, this school originally educated the white children of the second ward, but by 1910, it came to serve an exclusively um, ethnic Mexican student population. In 1920, a separate school is built for Mexican-American children called Lorenzo de Zavala. Uh, it was built in Magnolia Park. Uh, in the 1920s, additional schools are also established. Uh, by 1940, almost 36,000 students, uh, Mexican-American students, are attending schools specifically for Mexicans, or Mexican schools, as they were called. In comparison, schools for blacks, uh, also called colored schools at the time, uh, 1910, uh, by 1910, over 5,000 black students were already attending segregated schools. Uh, schools like the Colored High School, Frederick Douglass uh, Elementary, Booker T. Washington High School, Gregory School. Uh, the Douglass School uh, served black uh, children of the Houston's Third Ward uh, since the 1890s. By 1894, there were six uh, schools for blacks uh, throughout the uh, city's different wards. Alliances between Mexicans and Anglos uh, facilitated solutions to, uh, to police misconduct. Fernando Salas, he's a jewelry business owner, and Frank Gibbler, he's a uh, a sympathetic Anglo ally, uh, newspaper owner, will help to establish La Asamble uh, Asamblea Mexicana. This is an early civil rights group in the 1920s. Um, and they helped to expose police brutality, work together you know, as a civil rights force, and help to out or, or suspend a, a sergeant, an HPD sergeant, who had mistreated Mexicanos in the prison or in the jail. Uh, they also helped to free uh, five individuals that had been uh, uh, wrongly accused in prison or in jail, the local jail. Uh, La Asamblea established rapport with the police, uh, identified the many difficulties faced by the Ameri uh, Mexican-American students in Houston schools. Uh, 
So at the turn of the century, it was classroom teachers, most of them women, who were the first line of authority. Uh, they were also required each month to report their students uh, who defaced uh, or misused school property, uh, reporting all students that had been rude or, or, or been uh, disruptive or disobedient. Uh, and and uh, any students, you know, they also had to turn in students who would either write or cut in vulgar language into school property um, to be suspended, to be suspended from school, be kicked out. In the early decades of the 20th century, the city commissioners appointed school boards which held authority over all school matters, uh, rules, that kind of thing, including the hiring of teachers, selecting textbooks, uh, the different rules and punishment as well. The school board elected superintendents uh, and held a complete, you know, who held complete responsibility and authority of the schools. This authoritative configuration would remain basically the same for most of the 20th century. By the 1980s, principals, administrators, superintendents would hold discretion over whether to decide to suspend students, arrest them, or, or send them to alternative schools. HISD principals and superintendents would be the deciders in the fate of many of these students, uh, you know, uh, students who were the offenders alleged offenders. So tracking students in schools, you know, this is not something new, right? Student tracking in Houston became pervasive starting in the 1930s as part of this national movement that was happening uh, to improve the public school setting. Uh, this dealt with new assessment methods, uh, student placement practices, uh, curriculum changes, uh, you know, th these types of programs or, or projects that were being implemented in all schools throughout the country. And of course, Houston is joining in this national movement. Schools would test these students' uh, abilities, establish new curriculums in trade, vocational and industrial courses, and as a result would track many of these Mexican-American students into these courses. As a result of this testing, uh, many were misdiagnosed. They were labeled subnormal, intellectually inferior, culturally backwards, uh, linguistically incompetent. Uh, once misdiagnosed, these students were tracked into classes for slow learners. Uh, some of these were ungraded classes, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> uh, or special education. In the secondary grades, higher up, they were tracked into vocational or industrial classes. And these vocational classes reinforce the existence subordinate position of Mexican Americans by limiting rather than opening opportunities, broadening their, broadening their educational opportunity. Many times, Mexican American students, you know, they really had little choice in the matter. Uh, they had little say, so these decisions were made for them. Um, this stratified, uh, stratification would reproduce the existing relations uh, uh, of social order, the economic world that existed outside of the school walls. By 1980, uh, 1980s, the, the tracking of students out of school and into the courts, into the criminal justice system. Now this was new. Um, students of color have increased risk of being suspected, uh, suspended, I'm sorry, expelled, arrested at school because of zero tolerance policies. Uh, we also see permanent police uh, presence in schools. So now minor disciplinary infractions were now criminalized, disrupting class, using profanity, misbehaving on the school buses, student fights, truancy, so skipping school, once meant a trip to the principal's office. Now these minor uh, misconducts are now considered crimes and students can be arrested or reported to the police. During the era uh, of protests, so think late 60s, early 70s, Anglo opposition undermined the struggle for civil rights. Local politicians, school leaders, academics saw this high poverty rate and student demonstrations as a sign of uh, a lack of, of law and order by the uh, Latinos, uh, instead of looking at more structural discrimination that was existing in institutions in Houston. 
when white communities argued that desegregating schools was going to disrupt, was going to be, have a negative effect on white students. Um, school officials created new disciplinary uh, policies. Historically speaking, policing students enforced social control over Mexican-American youths who had previously been kept out of schools, segregated based on language policies. They could now be funneled into a prison pipeline. Giving white teachers and administrators the authority to label a lot of these students as pre-delinquents in the 1960s would give shape, give way to the school-to-prison pipeline you know, that started in the 1980s and became more prominent in the 1990s. As a response to a series of Mexican-American walkouts in 1969 throughout the city, throughout different high schools and even middle schools, um, uh, you know, they were protesting being punished for speaking Spanish. They wanted more Mexican-American teachers. They wanted Chicano curriculum up on the, you know, in front of the class. Uh, uh, but HISD would uh, hired its first, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, you know, yeah, HISD would hire its first uh, security guards in 1970. Uh, following uh, Nixon's um, you know, rhetoric on war on poverty, you know, this quickly started to clamp down on schools, student protesters during the civil rights movement, resulting in the militarization of schools. Alcohol. Drug-related crimes related to HISD campuses did increase in the 1980s. In the first half of the uh, uh, 1986, 87 school year, uh, 142 students were arrested by HISD security guards or uh, security personnel compared to the 122 total of the previous year, uh, 85, 86. When HISD security personnel made arrests, Houston police were automatically called in to take the violators into custody. According to Les Burden, he's a HISD security chief, quote, we do press charges to maintain safe schools conducive to student learning, end quote. In 1988, HISD now has 77 security guards uh, with at least one station at every high school. Um, the 26 middle schools also had one full-time guard. Later that year, HISD funded the training and salaries for three special security teams of HPD officials, uh, officers, to patrol uh, 20 secondary schools. Uh, some were trained in riot control, you know, criminal investigations, that kind of thing. Also, eight new HISD officers uh, were also hired to address ongoing concerns, security concerns at these schools. So if a student gets into a fight, uh, the police take action, take them to the station, uh, wait for their parents, and then receives a citation. Discussions about the possibility of sourcing out the HPD to oversee HISD security would begin in spring 1993. Under President Clinton, the Gun Free Schools Act of 1994 provided this initial incentive for zero, policy, uh, uh, zero toler tolerance policies. The Safe Schools Act of 1994 uh, promoted the partnering of schools and the police, specifically providing uh, the provision, the funding for these schools to build their own police stations within the walls of their schools or to hire um, school uh, resource officers, uh, resulting in this image of what we picture of these, uh, you know, police schools, right? Uh, metal detectors, uh, canine uh, patrols, tasers, uh, police presence, uniforms, uh, security cameras, uh, even priests and ministers brought in to counsel these students. These, enhanced, uh, these kinds of enhanced security measures were largely inspired by the school shootings that were happening, especially in the 90s, late 90s, in wh white suburb, uh, suburban schools. However, here in Houston, this growth of militarization of the police presence was more related to gang or gang-related activity uh, on HISD campuses. 
as a tool for exclusionary dis discipline. Students are removed by school, by suspension, expulsion, forced into alternative schools, uh, pushed towards dropping out, uh, and charged in juvenile court, uh, routed into the prison uh, uh, pipeline. In the early 1990s, one out of every 12 student was booted out of HISD classrooms. Out of these nearly 24,000 students, um, over 1,000 of them were turned over to the police. However, just to be clear here, it's not HPD who is policing these students on HISD campuses. HISD has its own PD, its own police department. Uh, the HPD is the only accredited public school district police department in the U.S. So while HPD does distance themselves from you know, policing these students or being connected to these uh, uh, policing students, um, many times these, uh, these uh, 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 students who are, uh, get in trouble are, are put into HPD vehicles, taken to HPD facilities, headquarters, held in HPD uh, holding cells until their parents come and pick them up. Um, so there is this connection with HPD, despite you know, what uh, HPD may say, uh, say, about, uh, say about that. Critics argue that these zero tolerance policies have been used to push out low performing students, especially in this era of no child left behind legislation. Uh, this President Bush era program directly tied uh, school funding to test scores. Um, and harsh disciplinary, dis uh, uh, exclusionary discipline. These policies provided schools a convenient method to remove underperforming, uh, undesirable students and conceal the school's educational shortcomings. Police-based enforcement of zero tolerance policies, it's predominant in schools where these test scores are low, they're overcrowded, uh, they lack funding, they lack the resources, uh, and they're highly segregated as well. The increased presence of police in schools parallel the increased surveillance of youth in segregated America. This increased presence of police in schools uh, has not promoted the confidence or trust among many people in these schools. But schools like HISD, uh, or school districts like HISD have this, quote, sophisticated and deeply entrenched school policing structure, end quote. They employ school uh, uh, police officers as, as school employees, collaborate with them to fortify uh, this police structure, keep it, uh, keep it together. And school administrators will accuse students of small offenses, such as disobedience, disorderly conduct, and then a police officer will arrest them for this alleged uh, conduct. The police officer may add a penal uh, uh, code punishment violation, such as disturbing the peace. Advocates and lawmakers have concerns regarding this criminalization of school-related misconduct because it you know, disproportionately impacts students of color. Due to the rising concern of schools overusing this exclusionary practices for you know, removal of undesirable or underperforming students. So let me share very quickly some of these numbers, right? This is more attributed to Texas wide uh, numbers, but let me show, um, you know, this is that time period, 1990, 1995, when these uh, uh, policies, these zero policy, uh, uh, zero tolerance and po policies are being en enacted. And you can see this bump here, 1990, 1995, uh, goes significantly up. I don't know if there's, uh, I don't wanna move too far out of the world, but uh, the same thing here, 1990s, you can also see, see uh, 1995, this huge bump, thanks you know, for the Hispanic uh, column. Uh, it's the second one to the end. Uh, and you can see how these policies you know, kind of triggered, right? Expo you know, uh, uh, bumped up these uh, totals, you know, 50, 53, 54, pretty high numbers. But let me share some also from Houston. According to a recent census data um, uh, in the early 2000s, Half of the Houston Latinos over the age of 25 lacked a high school diploma. 
um, compared with 26% citywide population. Uh, only 10% of Hispanic adults go to college compared to the 28% for the city overall. The reasons for you know, these uh, high dropout rates in Houston, Latinos, uh, Latino youth is, is also diverse. This includes struggling with learning English, uh, needing to work, needing to help the family, leaving school, uh, coping with unplanned pregnancies. And so the solutions can also be just as complex as these problems. Now add to this the policing of students that results in police records. And so these opportunities these get smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, many realize in their 20s how hard it is to get a, a job without a diploma. I know I kind of skipped this uh, slide, but um, I can make this available to, to anyone. Um, and I do want to share something because, you know, uh, as a historian, we're not always in the business of providing recommendations, right? But I am always interested any time possible that I can uh, present or share uh, a usable history. So here are just a few recommendations. You know, we, I know this is a, the college for it. I know that this is the space for it, this forum for vital voices, the students are criminal justice, social workers, you know, potentially become educators. So, you know, this is stuff that can be uh, helpful, right? Uh, alternative disciplinary strategies. So while strict disciplinary actions, especially for violent or very disruptive behavior, can be helpful, you know, if, if it results in a uh, uh, police record for a minor misconduct, you know, that shouldn't be happening. On-campus intervention programs, like counseling, support services for students to, to, to modify challenging behavior, but also providing opportunities to learn life skills. That's a good thing. You know, uh, life skills such as effective communication, goal setting, working with the students to help them make, you know, decision making, the right decisions. Uh, cultural competency training. I know we live in Texas and that's been done away with. We can't really be talking about diversity, that kind of thing. But there's still uh, efforts that we can make to correct that, right? Um, allowing professionals to become more aware of the cultures of others. That's always good. It helps to, under, to, to answer how and why certain stereotypes, uh, discriminatory beliefs exist. Uh, being aware of these potential stereotypes can help or have a significant impact on the ways that school staff, educators treat their, their youth. Um, eliminating zero tolerance policies. Also, you know, the evidence is clear that these policies that seek to exclude students from schools, uh, the educational process are not really in the, uh, uh, the, the public's best interest or the student's best interest. Research evidence proves that zero tolerance policies that feature mandatory punishment for minor offenses do not work and in fact exacerbates more misbehavior. They also point to unsafe school environments, a lack of improvement on terms of students' academic performance. Um, you know, a, a more uh, tangible, you know, reducing uh, effort uh, is reducing class sizes, right? Teachers can only control the students, so, uh, so many students. In truth, class size is one of the most effective ways to uh, uh, improve the outcome of students and teaching. Okay, so that is all that I have for you. I appreciate your time and thank you for listening. Uh, I'm very grateful for uh, Vital Voices to invite us here. Stephen, uh, thank you for having us. Uh, we do want to open this up with uh, you know, some uh, uh, Q&A, I believe. Is that uh, part of the, the structure, I think, the forum? Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Do, do, we have any, do we have any comments or questions for our speaker? I'll come to you with a mic. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you both for this amazing presentation and, and for the hard work that is put behind to get this book together. I think it's going to be a very important uh, piece of literature and not just for the academia, for the community itself to kind of see what's 
was there before was there now. Uh, my question is about um, parallel to the story that you laid out about from the 1920s and 30s and what happened in schools and the evolution of the school and policing in schools. Um, there's the parallel story that you mentioned, which is the administrative side of the, the, the equation and the police force or forces involved at the same time. And I think if I heard it correctly, along the way, the presence of um, Latinx, Latina people in those two environments, right? The, the, the law enforcement side and, and policing side, as well as the administrative side, have increased parallel to the number of, um, has that have an impact on the policies? So you're talking about the, you know, the, the hiring of Latinos, Latinx Absolutely. into the police, uh, um, you know. Uh, the I, yeah, um, and the school administration. In my, hello? That's, that's good. Hello, hello. Uh, I, you know, I, I have not found that evidence and I haven't found enough to tell you that that has been, you know, better. I have a feeling that in more recent history that that has been um, something that has occurred, but I really don't have the numbers. And my, and my educated guess is that yes, that, that, that might have improved conditions, uh, but I, I'm not totally sure about that. And, and I'll add to that, if I may, um, an, another chapter of this book project looks at the Latino integration of HPD. And s it, since before the 1940s, there's been, a, there's been a growing number of Latinos in the police department, right? Dr. Contreras can account to that in his chapter. But we really see that number grow in the 1950s. After 1950, that number is growing and has become so that they become like the largest ethno-racial group in the department. But along the, with that, right, because the question was, does the presence of more Latinos in police forces, does that reduce the number of police brutality cases? In another chapter, we're arguing that that does not, that the number of police brutality cases continues. And you look at Nick Chavez, for example. Nick Chavez uh, was, was shot and killed by law enforcement uh, while on his, on his knees and arms up. Uh, and some of those officers were Latinos. Right, so more Latinos on the forces doesn't always translate into a reduction of police brutality cases. And so, now, this is preliminary research, and I'm sure there are other studies elsewhere, but in Houston, that has not been the case, not so far. So what, what do you think that alludes to? What, what, what suppositions can you make from, preliminarily from that data, if any? Well, it. I'm hearing you say it's not. It's not just the the non-Latino police that are brutalizing, whether it's Latino or not. So, what do you get? No, I I, I get what I think most of us uh, probably already uh, have known and are learning uh, is that there is a crisis in the way we police civilians in in our society. We over-police more than any other civilized, or not civilized, uh, um, developed. developed, excuse me, that's the word, my apologies, developed country on the planet. And in some counties, we got more people in bars than we got in the classroom, behind bars than in the classroom. And so I think that we're a hyper-policed society, uh, and I don't think the demographics, changing demographics goes far enough. And I think in the education side, there's, the teachers are worried about passing students or, or, or passing the test, right? Getting the test numbers up, right? Uh, that's, what ha that's what's happening in Houston I HISD right now, right? This takeover. And so I think regardless of if the teacher is someone that looks like these students of color, um, they also want to produce those numbers. And so if, if they can, get students who are underperforming, um, you know, do not do well, disrupt class uh, out of the way. I don't think, you know, I, I, whether, you know, I think regardless of, the, of the, the, the color of their skin, I think that they would also uh, want that student out of the way. And so I would uh, assume the same thing that it doesn't change. It doesn't change this, uh, uh, the, the conditions in schools. 
Go ahead. So am I hearing you say that it's not as much a, a racist issue as it is more of a systemic issue? I, I would not. I would not. Uh, I would not say one trumps the other. I don't think that it's one issue over the other. I think that it's a combination of several issues, like racism, like systemic inequality, like poverty, like a lot of things. Uh, and so, for me to say it's this thing, I think that uh, does a disservice to right what we're trying to the mission of this book because I think it's multiple things. If there are multiple relationships between with, between Latinos and law enforcement, then there are multiple reasons for why those relationships aren't always good. So. Well, I mean, to educate, to heal, to prevent future uh, instances of police brutality, to uh, showcase and, 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 uh, and inspire other acts of civil rights. When uh, Latinos joined the police force in the 1950s and 60s, that's an act of civil rights. And we want that to be inspirational. We want people to do and continue to destroy segregation wherever segregation might exist. So it's got multiple goals and multiple missions. Some other people are asking questions. You've got a great line of questions, and so I don't want to pull away from you. We want to come back to you, but we want to make sure we get others. I saw a hand over here. I'm sorry, right here. Thank you, first of all, for doing this, because we need more education for our people about our history, because we're 47-something percent here in Houston, and we don't have enough representation, and that's just not... It's unreasonable. So I see that you have recommendations up there, but I, I wrote a question. So I was asking what kind of social services or tools are provided to the American students of Mexican descent who are being policed in schools to help them to have a better opportunity in life now that we know how prevalent it is for students to, who struggle with behavior problems because they have undiagnosed learning disabilities or cognitive disabilities or, leave, or live in extreme poverty. So it's not that they're necessarily bad kids, but if you could say that there's one type of social service that you can provide to them while policing them um, and their families, what would that look like? And also another thing is, um, does the new superintendent, because he's the one that's, re he, he's forcing the teachers to behave in this manner. So does the new superintendent and his NES um, system uh, kind of mirror what was being done to us in the 1950s and 1960s? Oh. Yeah. Um. I actually do not have a, a, an answer for you. You're talking about a specific program that, that could be useful to this. Uh, I do not have an answer for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I do not have an answer for you. Can you hear me so? No? Oh. We can believe this. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, there were, uh, I'll show one, um, you know, on campus intervention program, you know, providing the counseling services. And this is kind of working with families, uh, working with, uh, uh, you know, building the trust from, from, from the families, getting them involved, bringing them into, I mean, there, I, I, I can't name a specific program for you, but there's these, you know, getting more counselors involved instead of uh, getting police called in for, uh, you know, this minor misconduct is to get uh, uh, counselors, right, to, to, to talk to them, interventionists, right, people who, who deal with emotional, em, emotional, uh, uh, I don't know if disability is the right word, but, you know, there are more emotional issues, right, instead of, you know, automatically taking them, calling in the police, picking up the phone and bringing, you know, a security guard to come in and deal with this. Instead of a security guard, get some sort of interventionist to, to come in, a school counselor to come in. Someone who's trained, a professional who knows how to deal with that. Uh, we see that too with uh, police shootings, right? Instead of calling cops to come in, we need to call, you know, a, 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 you know, a psych, a psychiatric doctor or professional to deal with these types of things. And instead of, you know, uh, automatically uh, sending the, the security guard or sending them to the police station, that kind of thing. It's, uh, but I, I don't have a, uh, a model. I don't have a model for you, but that's a great question and uh, something for me to look into. Yeah, yeah no, I agree. That, that, so those, you know, we appreciate the tough questions. We don't have all the answers. And, and I think, you know, we, we make that pretty clear. But 
so, but thank you for that question because it is it is a real hard question, and I think that what that does is that kind of gets me to think about doing this presentation in front of teachers and getting into classroom settings and with educators and with parent groups and liaisons and because they will have the answers, I think. And now they can share those answers with us and now we have answers too so that when we're asked the hard questions that way, we can provide what we've learned because this is always an opportunity for us to learn and grow. So I thank you for that and we just don't have an answer for you. But I imagine someone in the audience does here or virtually. Uh, but speaking of virtually, I think we also have a question from someone online. Yes. Okay, so if anyone wants this slide deck, when you take the survey tonight, which will be the QR code will be up on the screen, just let me know in the comments. I want a copy of the slide deck and I will email it to you. But the question we have online is uh, the comment is I'm so appreciative of this work that you presented today. It is important to continue to highlight this work as we watch the takeover at HISD. How do you? How do you think this will affect the school to uh, school to prison pipeline process? As for, as far as um, uh, the HISD takeover, how will this affect it? Yeah, within the context of HISD takeover. Uh, I I <laughs> there there's two thinkings. Either it's going to exacerbate the conditions. It's going to force students out because the reason why there is this takeover is to hide in those numbers and uh, get away, you know, uh, take care of troubled spots. And I think in that process of taking care of troubled spots is also eliminating students that do not perform well in those courses, which is a very uh, unfortunate outcome, but something that I think it will probably happen. Um, uh, now, in the flip, you know, on the flip side of that, those numbers may improve, may look good, uh, and, and so people can feel good about that, but it's probably to the detriment of, of some of these students. So. Another question, is there interest to hear if you found ways that parents and caregivers are getting involved to protect, um, to protect students? I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, s these recommendations that I shared with you were things that I pulled from, you know, different ACLU, different organizations that are uh, uh, doing, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, tackling, challenging, confronting this uh, st uh, school to pipe uh, to prison pipeline. Um, and so modern terms, modern day, that's where I'm, I'm limited, right, in answering that. I looked at the, the history, went into the archives, uh, looked at, you know, the Houston Chronicle at the HMRC down the street. But, I, um, you know, so speaking in more modern terms, contemporary terms, my, my insight is rather limited. So. I know we had a question here in the audience. Well, hold on. Let's give you the mic. I have a big amount of problems. Getting my steps in today. Thank you. There you go. Um, I just had a comment. I think you kind of touched on her second question that she had, um, which I think it's interesting. So you said, are they, is HISD the same, like, back in the 1950s, removing, uh, what was it that you said something about places? Yes, okay. Correct. So so I think so I believe I think you pretty much answered your own question by saying that Yes, it's, I feel like it's probably worse now than the 1950s because you're taking these safe spots for students that do have psychological problems. They're crossing the border. They don't speak the language. They are, you know, new to this country. And some of these places that they're thrown into, it's uh, not, they don't have bilingual education. So you have to sink or swim. You're le having to learn English right away. And I... I think I, I came into the presentation late. I really like what y'all are doing. Um, I think, I know this is great. It's, it's a lot. 
it's a lot. I think uh, I find a solution would be for us to vote, vote against um, Ted Cruz and the vouchers, because that's not the way. Selecting schools that way is not going to bring inclusion for everybody. And so it, like HISD is failing. I feel it's failing. I see my niece there and I don't like what I see. So thank you. And you know, oh, yes. You know, one other com component, one other complication that happens here is not just the school to prison pipeline, but also the school to prison to deportation pipeline. And that's a whole nother level. Again, a, kind of more a contemporary, I mean, I don't think it's a contemporary concern. I think that concern had always been there. But now there's a, a research being done on that, contemporary research being done on that, that, you know, that I had not even thought about, you know. And so the, those types of issues, you know, get even more complicated, get even more dire for these students who, you know, might have an outburst, uh, you know, minor misconduct, whether it's truancy or if it's acting up in class because, you know, school is boring and, and some of the teachers may be boring. Some teachers are probably, I, I know are, are fantastic because the students tell me when I, you know, they come into the college class and they say, I had great teachers. I always loved history. I always love hearing that. But, uh, you know, not every teacher is energetic, right, or, 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 or it makes an impression on the students. And so they may act up. Uh, but, you know, if you are here undocumented or your parents are, or, uh, and that, that, that adds to another layer of, of concern, of danger, right, of fear that, uh, you know, um, or, or, you know, I wasn't thinking. I just acted up. I wasn't thinking. We're impulsive, right? We're as teenagers. Um, I'm older now, but I still, you know, I'm young at heart, so I remember what being a teenager is like. And so I did a lot of dumb things, you know, and so uh, I'm glad I've grown up. Um, not so much a question, just I really wanted to kind of piggyback off for your, off of your question, but then also to thank you all for this amazing work. It's been a pleasure to be here. Um, I have so many thoughts, so I was like jotting notes down, but... Um, so I'm a macro social worker. And so when y'all said present this information to educators, um, I think that's wonderful. I think um, also to, to answer some of yours, so, so what can parents do, what can community members do is really advocate specifically for social workers. A lot of times we say counselors because we don't know, especially the Latino community, we do not know what social workers are, where we are, what we do. So I say we're the profession that's everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And what that means is that we don't have a badge that says social worker. Um, our capes are usually invisible. And so um, really advocating and what that looks like is call like the uh, you know, Tia Mary and Ms. Hernandez and somebody else and say, hey, we really need to schedule a meeting with the principals, Amiga, because we, we really need to have social workers. We need to push for this school, particularly in HISD, because HISD is historically known for not hiring social workers. I think in the whole district, there might be only five, maybe. I don't even know if that's accurate, so don't. <laughs> but um, specifically, <laughs> specifically asking for for uh, social workers trained um, in crisis intervention, um, emotional support, um, and have that education training because social workers are much more than just you know CPS and taking kids away. That's not that's not what we do. Um, the other thing is off of your comment to vote. Um, just teaching the the you know our, our it starts in elementary civic engagement, that's something that wasn't taught in our family. Um, I learned that sadly late in my 40s, how that looks. And now my family, we're all like civically involved. We, you know, we register voters and stuff. Um, but voting, like, you know, that that is so important. Who Our voice does matter, and our vote uh, determines who gets hired, who... Um, who puts social workers in, you know, what do we teach in our... Um, academia and stuff, so really voting. But I would just say mobilizing, that is something that, that can start next week. That doesn't have to start January 1st. That starts next, that starts tomorrow. Thank you. I should invite her to be a writer in this book project. I see a question over here, yes, I'm coming to you. Hello. Uh, 
firstly, I wanted to take, thank y'all for doing this. I really appreciate um, what you're doing. Uh, I wanted to talk about a specific point you had on how um, uh, schools were um, suppressing uh, or at least uh, disadvantaging Mexican-American students. And I wanted to touch on the topic of langu language. I wrote a bit about this for my uh, essay last semester about how we have always been suppressed based on our language. So like right now we're only speaking in English, even though it's, you know, it's a thing, like a safe space for Mexican Americans. We've always been taught to uh, basically conform ourselves to be this, have this standards of language within our education system, how you have to only, can only move up if you speak a certain language or if you behave a certain way, you can't have, you know, Spanglish or anything like that. So I just wanted to know your comments or your insights on that, because I know I did research on this, but I think it's, I don't think it's ever comparable to what you guys know, because you guys have the, all that education. So, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll share a personal anecdote. You know, I, I, I knew Spanish before I knew English. Uh, and my parents were never like, oh, you need to know English. Uh, I got that in, in school, but I didn't get punished. By the time I went to school, uh, there was no students being punished for speaking Spanish. My teachers were Latina women. And so I didn't see that. My parents talked to me about being punished, you know, or my, my dad wet his pants. He probably doesn't appreciate this, but wet his pants because he couldn't say it in, uh, in English. And so the teacher, as a punishment, told him, no, you're going to have to speak to me in, in uh, English. And he had an accident. And so, you know, these are stories I hear growing up, and they didn't really have an impact on me until later on. You know, I teach Mexican-American history. My Spanish is the worst. You know, I'm embarrassed about that, right? I wish I, I could speak better. I, my mom, you know, she talks to me in Spanish. I respond in English. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I have some students in my class, and I'll tell them, if you, if, if you prefer to speak Spanish, you know, I may not respond in Spanish, but uh, I'll understand you. Uh, and and if, you feel, you know, if you feel more comfortable, uh, you know, I, I don't have any issues with that. I don't know if that's necessarily answering your, your question. Yeah, and, and so let me also sort of try to answer this. It's, you know, like Carlos, I went to school way back in the 1900s, but not so far back that when I was in school, I was prohibited from exercising my right to speak Spanish. I wasn't censored that way. Uh, and my parents were educated in Mexico, so they didn't get that either. Uh, you know, they were already adults with kids when they brought us here to the, or when they came to the U.S. Uh, but I, I do know that historically, that has been a problem. And I know I did a research, and I'm not, this is not a selfish plug, but you know, we talked about my publication, Raza Schools, uh, with the University of Oklahoma Press. And I did a study, this, this, this is a study of a community in West Texas, where I interviewed people who uh, attended a one-of-a-kind school district. Uh, and uh, these were Mexican-Americans who founded their own school system, a TEA-recognized school system, accredited ISD. I don't mean a Mexican school in a district. I mean, this was a school district for, by, and of Mexican-Americans. And since the 1920s, I mean, they were do teaching curriculum in, bilingually, right? I mean, in English and in Spanish. They were teaching uh, cultural heroes and introducing... Uh, writers uh, from the Mexican and Mexican American uh, circles, and I mean, it was culturally competent. It was it was it was bilingual, it was the way we might think of dual language instruction today, or the way we might think about ethnic studies programs today, in that they were instilling pride and culture and, and those kinds of things. And so, but that's the exception to the rule. The rule was that right, Raza could not speak Spanish because in some of those same interviews, I learned that a lot of these persons would be fined. A penny, I mean, a penny doesn't seem like a lot, but a penny in the 1930s, that's a lot. A nickel in the 1940s is a lot. They would be fined money or they would be corporally punished, right? Uh, getting the swatted on the back of their knuckles or things like that or get sent to the corner or, you know, whatever the, the corporal punishment was. And so historically, I think that there's been an effort to erase that sort of cultural language and that cultural trait uh, of a population because schools in many ways have always tried to assimilate the learner. Uh, to, to, you know, teach them one language and one way and one value. And now, right, in many ways, I'm, I'm going to go so far as to say it, 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 there's efforts now to try to teach our learners one religion. I mean, I'll go there. I'll take us there. I'm, I'm not afraid of anything, 
right? And so, but this has always been the objective of the schools in a lot of way, the American public school system. Uh, but yeah, historically, that has been the rule. So one of my friends is a teacher at Sharpstown High School. She's uh, from Spain, and she was hired because she's bilingual, and that's a majority Spanish-speaking school. And she was just told that she is not allowed to speak Spanish to her students, which are majorly Spanish-speaking. So she teaches physics. How is somebody who doesn't understand the language is going to understand physics? Um, and so I think they are going back again, to the same things that they were doing to the Americans of Mexican descent back then. And when you talked about um, how they were promoting the idea of subordinate positions for uh, people like us, my husband is, grew up in California, and so he was um, referred by his counselor to take woodshop classes and take a woodshop uh, training and so his parents went to the principal and said no my son is not going to take this class as much as that would have helped him but he, he still does some of that stuff but <laughs> he ended up going to Stanford so it's not they wanted to limit him. limit him into a position of subordination instead of letting him live up to his potential and he wasn't a he wasn't a bad student he was just very hyperactive and so Again, we go back to the misdiagnosing of people's or students' uh, learning barriers, maybe, if we could say that. My son has ADD, and so I couldn't get him tested. He goes to HIZ. I could not get him tested through HIZ. I had to pay out of my pocket to get him tested and then fought with the school to get uh, 504 accommodations. And so they're doing that because they know that we're a growing population, and they want to put us back to where they think we should be. Uh, let me, oh. Okay, we're, we're gonna get to the onlineers. We wanna respond to this question and comment. And, and really, it's, it's just a comment. It's not so much a, a response, but you know, when students, um, you know, present day, uh, becoming a plumber, an electrician, uh, those types of jobs, you know, pay well. But when the student doesn't have a choice, doesn't have a say, and we're going to make this decision for you, that's where things you know, are, get out of hand or it's unfair. It's not right. But if you, you, know, if, if you, or you, you, know, if you can say, I, I don't want to go to college. I, I don't see myself as college material. But that's the choice that, you know, you know this, it, it's on them. It's on, on, on the student. So if they say it out loud, uh, if they don't, you know, if they prefer to take that route, that's fine. But when somebody else decides for you, that's where the trouble starts, right? So that's all I was going to say. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would agree with that. I'm going to keep it short. I'm going to agree with that because historically also we know that the Latino learner has been tracked into vocational kind or industrial or occupational kinds of curriculum. And I'm not throwing shade at that. I think that those things are, are useful, but that should not be the only option made available to this population. The learner should have all options made available. And when you're tracking this population and only this population to a specific, then that becomes problematic. And so in many ways, I think we are getting closer to that. We got two online questions. Oh, we got, we're gonna go over here and then we're gonna go to the online questions. Um, so in regards to the cultural competency training, what would that look like? And also, how would someone prioritize what gets implemented in that training? Like, how would someone prioritize, oh, it's going to be this thing that's going to be taught to this group for this purpose? And what would that look like? I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, if, if we lived in a city like Houston, super diverse, so you'd have to have different representatives, right? Different people coming in and talking about that. But if you lived in a, you know, like, like South Texas, 85% Mexican American, um, you know, then uh, I, I would, you know, I would figure that it would be community feedback, community relevant, right? Locally relevant uh, information, right? Um, you know, disrupting stereotypes, like saying that, you know, Mexican Americans are more, not more apt to disruptive behavior than Anglos or Caucasian students, 
But for some reason, students of color get singled out more, get in trouble more for that, and leading to this school to prison pipeline, right? The higher numbers of uh, youth, or it, you know, it doesn't always have to be youth, but just people of color of all ages. Um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily answering your question. Plus, we, you know, we are living in this time where that got taken away. These departments got taken away from university settings, from the workplace. So, you know, now we can't do that. But, you know, there, I think there are strategies where we can rearrange, we can rename that, you know, where, you know, maybe it will be cultural competency. I mean, of course, you know, if somebody doesn't want that to be taught, they're gonna say, oh, that's just D DEI in another, you know, in another name, by another name. I, I would say, um, and that, that was a fantastic question, I would say, you know, something as simple as, you know, learning Spanish, learning the history uh, of this community, you know, it, making sure that MAS programs in K through 12 stay there. Making sure the ethnic studies programs in K through 12 stay there. Make sure that students can take African American history, Mexican American history, Asian American history. Fight for those things to stay there. Tell your administrators don't take these classes away, because you know we teach at an HBCU, and you know a lot of our students are receiving cultural competency because these are mostly African Americans who say, "Oh wow, that happened to you, man. That's just like it happened to us." And then now there's that aha moment. That's cultural competency right there manifesting manifesting itself. So it could be learning Spanish, it could be learning the history, it could be learning the cuisine, it could be all kinds of things, but it's gotta be something. Otherwise, there is no cultural competency. And I'm not saying that always works, but it's a start. And it's a start in the right direction, I think. That was a fantastic question. Let's go to the online questions. All right, so thank you for your important work. If you had a chance to explore how these zero tolerance policies have been affected by the state of takeover of your giant city, what would you like to do? Oh. More, more, more con contemporary yeah, questions. Contemporary. Uh, no, I, 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 I don't. Uh, no, I don't. Are I don't. You, are you planning to? <laughs> well, look at, look at well, you know, if I intend to go and do more talks like this, I think I need to dig in a little bit more in some of these contemporary issues because I have some opinions, but they're really just opinions and it's not, you know, uh, research based. You know, there's these ideas that, yeah, I don't, you know, it doesn't feel good. I don't like it. I hear things, but, you know, but it's not grounded in, in research, you know, and, and that research is, you know, it's coming out right now, you know, it's in the newspaper right now. And there are, you know, kind of the beginnings of studies, I imagine, that are being produced because that this is relatively uh, or very recent history. So um, I can't, you know, so I, I, I feel very bad to not have a, an answer, but that makes me want to, okay, I need to dig in a little bit more. I need to uh, prepare or, you know, at least keep my eyes not in the archives, not in the past and history, but also looking ahead, especially dealing with this topic. Yeah, and, and I would say also, that was a great question from the onliner. I, I would say also that I, I think, because this book is out, for, is out being reviewed now. It's, it's out being reviewed. And I think that's probably one of the comments that a reviewer is going to ask. is says, hey, close this up with maybe a snapshot of the contemporary. And so, yeah, that's probably forthcoming. So thank you for making the online question, right? The onliner, thank you for making part of that making that a part of our spirit, right? You sprinkled it on us. And so we're going to go to sleep on that. We're going to meditate on that. And we're probably going to find room for it then in your chapter or within the book, because that is absolutely necessary. Texas, yeah. 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 So, so what I'm going to do is I saw I saw hands jet up into the sky when you asked your question, and I'm going to give him the microphone. I, I was thinking of the same thing because one thing is to to think about cultural competency, what that might look like. Another thing is to get get that implemented in schools and have. The, the administration actually want to be implemented. But I'm also thinking about the questions that we were having, the discussion that we were having about um, social work and um, cultural competency and language competency as well. And being in a university environment and the College of Public Service, maybe we can come together with a, a series of modules 
that maybe we can make available for schools and, and, and teachers and parents about what that might look like. And it will not cost anything. It will be just our effort, collective effort, coming up together with modules that can be deployed to educators and students and their families. And maybe not just cultural competency for uh, Latinx or, or, or Latino community, but even for the other way, like immigrants who need cultural competency in, in, in navigating the American system as well. If we, when we have social workers here, we have educators here, we can maybe come up with an effort that we can put together a, a module that available in YouTube or something like some platform that they can just, you know, go to them for resources. Yeah, and I saw another hand. I'm going to let the other hand speak as well. Was your hand up too? Yes, it was. It's been up. <laughs> and I'm going to stand up because it's been up. Uh, but again, one, I want to thank all of the students that are here today because this is an amazing topic. When I saw Hispanic on there or Mexican on there, I told my friend, I'm like, we got to go. Sorry, we're skipping class today. Um, and part of it is because this is a topic that needs to be talked about. This is a topic. And that's why I want to thank you guys for being here because nobody wants to talk about the Mexican culture. We are so minimized as it is. We're the last people to be taught about. Another thing is, I want to bring it out to Mr. Viano, Dr. Viano, is social workers in HISD. There is no, I'm a social work major. I graduated in December. <laughs> but again, no social work is placed at HISD as a practicum. We have to do our practicum before we could graduate. We are being placed at other fields. I wanted to do school social work because I come with an education background. But when I got placed in a mezzo practice, which is community building and rebuilding, which I love doing, it came to me that, you know, why aren't social workers being invited to HISD schools when we have teachers, our own educators in UHD that are stepping foot in HISD campuses. So that's what I want to bring up to Dr. Viano. Let's start there. Let's start having our social work program be involved in HISD. Instead of putting us in other, we have some students that are traveling to Sci Fair to, uh, to out of areas where this is our home, UHD is HISD. You know, so that was another thing that I want to say. Another thing, when do we expect this book? Because I am very interested in reading this book. Uh, well, I mean, the life cycle of books start to finish is three years. We started this last September. We finished the first year. It's out okay. to be reviewed. Uh, maybe we hear back by the end of this month. I don't know how fast Carlos can work to get his changes. I work fast. Okay. So, I mean, it's it, you know, if all goes well, we get the two thumbs up, and it's looking good. Uh, I say uh, by by the end of 2025, 2026. Okay, now. we'll look for it. Is that okay? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we won't pressure you. I want to make a comment too. So, if HISD doesn't have school counselors, then that's an issue that people have. To people have to get involved. That's another issue where people have, I think you were saying before, people have to get involved to make a stand. Look how many people are in this room. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 that's that's what we're make I think I'm trying to make the point is that just being here, it's knowing more, knowledging ourselves more about cultural competency. A lot of people don't know what that is. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't know what that was until I got to UHD and I took my first social work class. You know, this is where I'm learning. You know, and then another question is, you said about getting more involved and getting a uh, part of what social workers do. Like I said, I work in the mezzo practice. Part of my job at, um, uh, at the place that I'm at, place that, is working with the community to be able to advocate for themselves. So I'm not just advocating for you, I'm helping you how to advocate for yourself. So that's building upon that. And that's one thing that I love of what I'm at and what I do is that I get to walk to Barrick Elementary, I get to walk to Sam Houston, you know, uh, high school with these parents and be like, they need support, they need help, and you are the school that needs to support them. And that helps them. But how can we do more? Or what are you doing to do more to that? Oh. We're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, okay. we, 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 we hit the 
ground running and we make connections. I don't know how many talks we went to already, how many conferences we, we've gone to, how many times we've reached into our own pockets to get to this spot and get to, so, I mean, we love doing this and we'll do this till the wheels fall off and hopefully the wheels never fall off and we'll do this uh, you know, invite uh, us. Yeah. Invite okay, and us. what areas are you serving? I, I know that you're doing oh. a talk at Lionel Castillo, which that is uh, like 72% of Latino community, so I'm very happy that you guys are attending there. But what other communities are you serving well, or are you talking to? Listening to you talk and then listening also to the comments earlier, I'll, I'll say what I said uh, earlier also. Uh, it looks like we should probably think about sitting down in front of a whole bunch of social workers. And we're here. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we know what. Yeah, we're learning. We're learning and we're growing. We'll talk to anybody and everybody. We'll sit down in front of law enforcement and talk to them. We'll sit down in front of administrators and talk to them. We'll sit down in front of anybody unapologetically and, and share this research. Anybody that wants to learn and grow, we'll do it with them. And so, absolutely. We will. Okay, thank you so much. She's on fire. Are there any questions or comments? I, I do want to let Carlos talk about a forthcoming and upcoming event that we want to invite all of y'all to, and all of y'all and y'all's families to. Yeah, so I, I think there's flyers out there. We wanted to share with you this Memorias of the Chicana Chicano Movement. Um, there's a QR code. You can sign up through the event, uh, uh, Eventbrite. And uh, it's free to register, but we want to kind of get a little, little bit of a head count. Uh, and so this is coming up in November. Uh, I need to look at it to see November 16th. Uh, and it'll be in the morning, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Leonel Castillo Community Center. And uh, we want you, um, even if you were not participants of the Chicano movement, please come out and just check, you know, come, come and join us. Uh, we'll have some donuts, we'll have some food. And just uh, just come and check it, you know, come and, come and see what we're doing. And, and uh, the more heads we come in, the more people that come in, we're, we're so grateful for that. We're also, COPE is also currently accepting membership. So if any, anyone get involved in public facing work and service work, this is the organization for you. So please contact us if you think you want to be a member. There are no membership fees. There are no membership fees. <laughs> How are you guys? You said you got to keep it reaching in your pockets. How are you guys paying for this? Recently, recently, the uh, AARP from Houston yeah. has you know, heard Jesse on a podcast and said, who is that guy? What is he doing well, you know, for that initial uh, history harvest? Was inspired, reached out to him, contacted him, said, we're going to provide $2,500 for your next event. And then found out, you know, we're going to be doing something else in December and said, we're going to help you fund that. And so it, it kind of fell in our laps. We've been talking about writing grants and doing this type of work, you know, to, to get that submitted, to get some funding. And that just fell on us. And we, you know, we're super blessed yeah, about that. It's man. a blessing that we have community partners that have done that. But prior to that, prior to that blessing, we were we were coming into our own pockets on it. And we were just digging deep, as deep as we can. Sometimes all we'd feel is our thigh, but we do what we gotta do to, to get these programs. These are important. This is important work. I, I mean, I wanna promote the book, and I wanna, I wanna talk about the book and the press, but the work is important. The work that Ramiro and Carlos and others have done, Dr. Tovar over at the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum, the work that they've done is important work. And so we, I wanna get that out, and I wanna make sure they get their research out. And I want to say one more thing. We have uh, Albert De Jesus. He's here. He's uh, the director from the Center for Latino Studies at UHD. And they, they've been supporting us from day one. And I uh, uh, just wanted to, um, you know, they're, they're, they're on, the, on the flyer. And uh, we just, uh, we're very grateful for these community networks, right? These community partners. So very grateful. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, guys. So, so I want to uh, implore you to please take our survey because it's important, okay? Um, and I just also want to say, you know, Carlos came to my office o over the summer, and we never met. He just walked in, and he said, uh, you know, and he said, hey, I hear you do Vital Voices. You know, he said, Mr. Villano, you do Vital Voices? I said, yeah, and I didn't know who he was. He, he, he teaches, he's an adjunct here at, at, in, in our college. I didn't know. Um, so, you know, we talked, and... and I, I, the point that I'm trying to make is it, it takes one person. So if you're asking how to get involved, they're telling you how to get involved. 
You know, join that, the, the organization, go, go to that event. You don't have to worry about it going into HISD and get, you do what you need to do. Like what they're doing and look at the effect that they're having where it's encouraging other people to get involved. That's what we have to do. That's what community engagement is about. That's what civic engagement is about. And you know, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, whatever the case may be, we're fighting against systems. Not just, we are fighting racism for sure, but we're also fighting against systems and we're fighting against funding. And how is that going to be affected? By people making their voices heard, which is why it's so important that their voice is heard, which, you know, no pun intended, it's a vital voice. We need to hear these voices. But going back to the point, get involved, get individually involved in what you're passionate about. Other people will follow you. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for online. And hopefully we'll see you next week at our next session. Thank you, gentlemen.